Okay, and it's recording now. So uh, what we'll do is we'll just give uh, just the next two minutes and before we officially start, but before we continue in that sense, okay, I have one or two people coming in. So it would be great to start at exactly 13.05. Let's just give, because sometimes Zoom, uh, it, it's very hard to log into Zoom and we don't want anybody to miss even a minute of this session. So that's why, but don't, don't worry, in subsequent se sessions will be, will be more strict with our time, if that's okay. Now, feel free to, to uh, use your video or if you want, uh, I'm happy for you to show your faces, your beautiful and handsome faces either way. So don't, uh, don't feel that you need to, to, to stay in the virtual shadow. <laughs> it's not necessary if you want to come out from it either way. And I think it's 1305, like I said, so I think it's appropriate that we should start. As people come in, I would be letting them in. So good afternoon, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be, to be here today. Uh, my name is uh, Christian Harrison, and I am a reader in leadership in the School of Business and Creative Industries of the best university in Scotland, and that's the University of the West of Scotland, and that's the truth. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure that we are running this. And I know all of you have you have seen this uh, this research seminar series in various platforms, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and it's been running for a while now. And I'm so happy that you took your time to be part of it. It promises to be a great session, so please uh, stay tuned. And not to talk uh, so much, uh, I would have loved everyone to introduce themselves, but I think we we are so many. So please feel free to use. Uh, the chat uh, box and tell us where you're coming from, introduce yourself. It's meant to be a very interactive session. So please tell people welcome. If you're, if you're in Scotland, if you're in England, anywhere you are, we want to know where you're coming from. So please feel free to use uh, the chat box to introduce yourself and say hi to everyone here at the moment. Uh, clearly is, a, is our research seminar series run by the School of Business and Creative Industries, also the best school in UWS. And we also have, uh, I know I can see Dominic laughing, of course, Dominic could definitely agree with me as the Dean of the school as well. But uh, the whole idea of the research seminar series is for, for us to be able to share our research and also provide a platform where we can engage both with the public and even in the school. So this uh, event, like you already know, is free for everyone. And we have more people even from outside the country here today both scholars, researchers, and practitioners. So this is a platform for us uh, to do this. Uh, normally with uh, the Zoom uh, with the Zoom rules, of course, we are, all, we are all used to Zoom at the moment. So please, let's try to mute ourselves. So when you're not talking, uh, please try to ensure that you're muted. Uh, I know uh, some of us, like so, someone like me, have kids around. So hopefully my kids won't jump in and just drop this. But if you need to go, please, let us know in that sense. Uh, of course, if there is a fire outbreak, I hope it doesn't happen. Your life is more important. Please, you can leave the screen. But apart from that, it's going to be great for everyone to be here. And we would see, we would, would be happy to have everybody engaged here today. So it's going to run in the next, uh, just uh, from now to hopefully it will, it will go beyond half two. But we have uh, the speaker also here, but I would I will introduce the speaker. Uh, in, in the later date. But not to continue talking and flapping really, I'm so excited as you can see about running this. So I will give uh, the, our Dean and the Professor of Crisis Management, Professor Dominic Elliott, who would provide uh, the welcome. Uh, Professor Dominic, I know he's very, very humble, is the, is the visionary behind this concept. And he will want to tell us much more about 
this the research seminar series going on and also about the, the school. So, Dominic, thank you. Thanks, Christian. I first say it is a real pleasure to see so many faces. It would be nice to see a few more faces if people feel a bit braver <laughs> out coming on screen. But as Christian says, uh, now I want to give and extend a really warm welcome to you all. This year's inaugural School of Business and Creative Industries Research Seminar. My thanks to Christian for leading on this. And I know we've been through a challenging 18 months, possibly as a school with remergers and what have you, maybe two or three years of challenging time. And I'm really keen that we begin to refocus on our research and the research seminar series is a key part of that in which a mix of external and internal speakers will be sharing their knowledge, their ideas, their thoughts on research, and I know will be extremely thought provoking. I'm especially delighted to be welcoming Professor Will Foster, who's Professor of Leadership, Director of MBA and Executive Programs at Keele Business School. And I've got to say, my curiosity sort of peaked when I look at the winding road of leadership and culture, reflections on practice and research in entrepreneurial, ecclesiological. I must admit, I had an idea of what it meant, but I did look it up just to make sure, health and educational settings. So I'm very confident that we're going to get very rich reflections on a range of different contexts. And I think that's really of great interest to me. And I know as a school, one of the things that will, I hope over time, already we, we, we're sort of there in terms of being the country's, the UK's leader in management KTPs, but being the partner of choice for enterprise in our communities. And I think that's going to be a real distinctive point for our, uh, for our school. So I won't say any more on that. I know that Christian is going to extend that further welcome, there, but it's really good to see you, Will. Really appreciate you taking the time out to, to be with us. If I pass over back to Christian. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, Dominic, for the introduction. And of course, uh, Dominic has told us much more about our school as well and the research seminar series. So uh, like Dominic rightly pointed out, we have the first uh, uh, speaker today, and his name is Professor Will Foster. I know I, 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 when we reached out to Professor Will and we told him about it and he said, oh, Christian, I'll be so delighted to be involved. He's that kind of person, very humble, very nice. So, and it's great to have somebody of that uh, stature to start this uh, inaugural series. And he will be talking about the widening role of leadership and culture, like Dominic has already pointed out. I'd just like to introduce who Will Foster is. Will is a professor of leadership and also the director of the MBA and executive programs with the Kill Business School. But before that, prior to joining higher education, he had, he had had a rich career in the commercial sector, including nine years as a senior consultant, working with a diverse range of clients from CEOs and directors of global corporations to local uh, business uh, SME owners. But for the past 15 years, he has also served as a volunteer director on various charity boards. Bill is a principal fellow of the Higher Education Academy and a member of the BAM Leadership Special Interest Group. So Will is, this is just a summary of the, uh, the extensive CV that Will has. So what Will will be talking to us in the next few minutes about and reflecting really from his rich background in practice and also academia on the wider role of leadership and culture. So after, after Will has presented and spoken about his experience, then please keep your questions. I know you have a lot of questions, so keep them. You can put them on the chat if you want, or you can decide to ask uh, 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 or one-on-one, -on -one, either way, I always prefer those uh, questions whereby you talk, but feel free to use the, the chat box to put your questions as well, then we will be able to answer the questions. So I can see Will smiling, so I don't want, I want to be quite brief, so I want to, because we came here for Will, not for Christian. So please, Will, thank you very much for coming and you have the platform. Thank you, Christian. I don't, uh, I don't know when I was last described as nice and humble, um, but it is, it is lovely. Uh, it's lovely to be introduced that way. So thank you. And, and good afternoon, everyone. It's really great to be with you. And I am, I am really honoured to offer the inaugural lecture for this research series, uh, UWS. And thanks, Christian and Dominic, colleagues at the Business School for organising and hosting the event. It's, 
I think it's going to be really critical going forward as, as uh, you know, bringing that lifeblood of, of sharing experiences into this space. Um, now, I, I, I'm usually quite modest and I wouldn't normally put those letters after my name on a slide like this. <laughs> um, but as Simon Weston says, um, all leadership is biographical. And, and he, I, he highlights the importance of, as leaders, for us to locate ourselves um, in order for our views to be contextualised in the social world. And so um, that's brilliant because it gives me a great academic excuse to talk to you about some of my favourite topics. Um, Christian said to me, could you come and discuss your research and maybe share something about yourself um, so that we can get to know each other? And so I want to think about research in practice uh, through my own journey, really, and this is summed up well by this, this title that you've already heard, The Winding Road of Leadership and Culture. And I think it's really important. I don't want to set myself up in any way as some sort of ultimate academic expert. I'm, I'm sure there are people in this room who are far more uh, experienced and expertise than, than I've got in some of the aspects I'm talking about. Um, rather, I'd, I'd rather you think of me as a fellow traveller who wants to share their experience of this winding journey of research and leadership practice as, as a means to stimulate some discussion uh, and, and to invite you to share that experience later on at the end of this presentation. Um, as a newly appointed professor just a few months ago, um, I see myself as a little unorthodox. Uh, so earlier this year when I was compiling my case for the new education and scholarship ch chair at Keele, um, that they'd recently introduced. Um, this phrase of being unorthodox uh, revealed itself to me because I didn't really fit in all of the usual orthodox categories. Um, my unorthodoxy comes partly from my career biography. I'm someone who inhabits lots of different worlds in my own practice and I try to bring them into dialogue around this topic of leadership and culture. Um, as well as that, I sort of accidentally became an ethnographer. Uh, and when I came across Bordeaux's idea of habitus, it was a very helpful concept because habitus is the physical embodiment of cultural capital. And you'll see from this slide that I embody various cultures. I've got 16 years in the higher education culture, 15 years on charitable culture, two decades of church ministry and theology, which is where the ecclesiology comes from. Um, and all that following 15 years of the for-profit sector, or should I say, uh, lots of subcultures of that for-profit sector. Now, historically, I wouldn't have included this slide because I've tended to keep my professional life very separate from my personal life. But more recently, as someone who strives to be an authentic leader, um, I think including a little bit about my non-work activities helps with locating myself. So I'm married to Vicky, who you see there. Um, she works for church and started her ministry training journey just this year. Um, you'll see down the bottom a few screenshots of me leading worship from some of our online services. And also at the bottom left is me preaching. Then above that is our Welsh Springer Spaniel Betsy, who's currently lying on the settee. And you might hear her as I talk if the bell goes. Um, above that are two younger daughters and on the right are my elder daughters from my first marriage along with my grandkids. So hopefully that's a brief introduction to me. And I share that with you by way as a prelude to my talk because on the first slide I mentioned this quote from Simon Weston that all leadership is biographical. Now the rest of this quote is extremely pertinent for us today and that is that leadership ideas emerge from the messiness of a wide variety of settings rather than the tidiness of academic ideals. And I love that. I love the fact that we can bring our messy lives from the real world into the academy and bring academic thinking that makes sense of it. So let's begin this winding journey of leadership and organisational culture. And I'm going to meander through a series of vignettes uh, using the experience from my leadership career as jumping off points to talk about leadership and culture. And I'm hoping, as I said, this will stimulate a conversation and discussions later. Now, whenever I talk to my MBA students, um, I always talk about uh, fog lifting moments. Um, I did my MBA in the early 90s and I joined Rolls Royce straight after graduating and they put me through this leadership development programme. 
for me, learning about the informal organization, organizational culture, power, politics, and things like that began to make sense of what was going on in the organization and was very powerful. You see, before that, I was a very analytical and rational employee. And as such, I've been really puzzled and frustrated by some of the seemingly bizarre things that happened in our company and the confusing decisions that, from my perspective, simply defied logic. Now, I assure you work for brilliant organisations and that never happens to you. Um, but for me, this revelation about culture suddenly started to lift the fog and I could begin to appreciate what was going on beneath the surface, the unseen dynamics that were shaping the seen elements of the organisation. And as well as organisational culture, another vital element of the MBA for me was reconceptualising my understanding of leadership. I think until that point, I'd had a fairly traditional and maybe naive view, and I'd maybe experienced more of the command and control, slightly autocratic, top-down approach. But reframing of the leader as a facilitator, coach and mentor allowed me to begin an authentic journey into the sort of leader that I wanted to be. So I ended up with a few new guiding principles from the MBA about organisations. And firstly, that investing in and developing in leadership capital is one of the most important things that an organisational can do. Now, whether that's you as an individual leader investing in yourself or it's the organisation looking at investing in its leaders, it makes sense to me that if everything rises and falls on leadership, it's something we ought to be putting a bit of attention to. Secondly, if we accept the first principle that everything rises and falls on leadership, then we need to consider carefully what the priority of that leadership should be. And as Ed Shine says, and he's one of my heroes, it's organisational culture. As leaders, our role should have a priority of occupying ourselves with our organisational culture. Now, there's a quite well used quote from Peter Drucker that those academics amongst us will know straight away. And it's this culture eats strategy for breakfast, which means you can have the best strategic plan in the world. But unless you attend to the culture, you're in danger of your strategic plan being derailed. And it's not just the academics who think this. John Connolly was the chief exec of Deloitte UK, one of the top consulting businesses. And he said this, while the business landscape had changed significantly over the last two decades, that there's no single critical factor that can be identified as being the secret to corporate performance. There's little doubt that the most significant influence is an organization's culture. Um, one of the other things I learned, but I didn't quite realize it at the time, and this is very relevant for those of you interested in research or on the research journey, and I'm sure those who are well on that journey can back this up. It was that the research journey can be a real roller coaster. But actually, when you look back, the bad things that happen tend to result in some good. So from my MBA dissertation, I decided to look at leaders in transition. And I was really fortunate to be able to study a new senior leader who was just about to join our business unit at Rolls-Royce. He was hired from another part of Rolls-Royce to head up our engineering department. He was experienced and he was a really nice guy. And he agreed for me to interview him regularly on a weekly basis over the course of six months for my dissertation project. Now, although the first few months, the honeymoon period went really well, sadly, after that, things began to take a turn for the worse. And over subsequent months, he really struggled with the transition to the extent that he, ext he ended up taking extended times of sick leave due to stress. And actually, after one time of sick leave, he just didn't come back. Now, this really affected me. I'm sure those who've researched topics like this, it, it does, it affects you because I felt really bad because because on the one hand, I really, really like this person. And, but at the same time, all of the interviews that I'd conducted and recorded provided a rich resource to analyze. And I was able to map the senior leader's journey onto a transition curve similar to the Kubler-Ross curve. Now, I haven't got my 1994 dissertation curve diagram. It was done on one of those 
three and a quarter floppy disk things. Um, but I managed to find this more this more recent version created by John Fisher a bit later in 1999, which is which is quite similar. So as you'll see, the initial part of the curve is an upward bit, and we call this false competency. This is where things seem to start well at the honeymoon period I mentioned earlier, because the leaders using their favorite techniques and strategies from their previous contract context and in the main they seem to work however this usually only lasts for a period perhaps maybe a couple of three months and when the honeymoon period is over then some of those early decisions that they made right at the start begin to come home to roost and some of the people who maybe have been given the benefit of the doubt or were weighing up the new person begin to change their behavior and then a turning point occurs a steep decline begins the job seems harder than initially thought and the old ways just don't work anymore and people start to question themselves and then right at the bottom is a slump and i like the term from pilgrim's progress which calls this sort of thing the slough of despond <laughs> and here everything just seems to be overwhelming and hopeless and it's at this point where some sort of critical change needs to happen. Either new learning occurs, in which case the senior leader begins to adapt new approaches and new techniques that work in their now context. And so they begin to climb the effectiveness and well-being curve again. Or, as you see there, the senior leader on the green curve might just get disillusioned and opt out and leave the situation. Or on the pink curve, they remain but continue to use ineffective strategies. They just don't learn. And this can have quite devastating and healthy effects. And perhaps some of you might be able to relate to this. I mean, from a personal point of view, I found this curve massively useful in my move to Kiel. Uh, I've only been at Kiel a couple of years. I joined in September, 2019. But if you go to my office just before lockdown, you'll see that this curve was drawn on my whiteboard. I was about six months in and I was in that slough. I was in that pit of despair. Lots of things had changed. We'd lots of, lost all our leadership team. Things weren't going as I'd hoped. Um, and this curve really helped me because I drew it to my mind every day and reminded myself why I was feeling how I was and what I needed to do to change that. And thankfully, um, I'm probably now somewhere on the uh, on the purple upward curve. Um, we've made some massive progress on the MBAs with innovative new innovative new online programs and, and things are really moving forward. Another thing I learned from the MBA wasn't about the course content, but was about the program philosophy. Uh, and my MBA wasn't a traditional chalk and talk, but it was one of the first ones that was really based on the cold learning cycle, recognizing that for mature adult andragogic learners, learning from experience from each other and from your own experience is as vital as anything to acquiring knowledge. So this idea of experiential learning described as a process of learning through reflection on doing is really critical to, to the rest of my career. As you see in the diagram, you have an experience, you reflect on it, then you apply the concepts and theories from academia and you learn from that and you try different things and you experiment as a result. And then you begin the cycle again. Now, what I learned from this is that in this cycle, it's as important to be interested in the process going on when undertaking a task than just the task itself. So the task is important, but if you see it as a vehicle for learning rather than an end in itself, you can really get rich learning. And it's why some people have one year's experience 10 times over, and other people have 10 or more years of experience in a much shorter time. And I completed my MBA in 1994, and I'm not sure I would have been able to articulate all what I've said to you today, but these seeds were definitely sown. And then through the practical, and the outworking of that, I'm able to reflect back. So this is the foundation that was laid. Let's have a look at how that worked out over the next few decades with a few vignettes. So I know that I said earlier that culture eats strategy for breakfast, but it's when I left Rolls-Royce to join Jonathan Lee that I saw the value of the interplay between culture and strategy. Now, Jonathan Lee was a small entrepreneurial business with a real family feel. It was brilliant. It was a boutique HR recruitment consultancy with the emphasis on consulting. 
Jonathan, who you see there, had set the business up in 1978. And back then, not many organizations were using HR recruitment consultancies. In fact, a number of our competitors were what we lovingly termed bucket shop agencies. So Jonathan Lee really set himself apart. And when I joined in 1994, MBA fresh in hand, we had around six or seven consultants, 14 to 16 employees, and a turnover of just below a million, I think. And I say I think because the accounts were never quite clear or consistent. The business was very much run on a barrel boy mentality where business decisions were based on what Jonathan intuited had happened. And that's a really funny example is um, in the early days, uh, all of us consultants were paid a bonus every quarter based on business performance. And one quarter, we had a 17% bonus. It was brilliant. But then the following month, Jonathan realized that there were a number of outstanding debts that hadn't been taken into account, which would have meant he shouldn't really have paid us a bonus at all. Now, although I was taken on as a consultant, I was also sorting out their business systems because I've got a business systems background. And I remember being invited into Jonathan's office, just him and his business partner. And, and, and a whiteboard full of bullet points was presented. And Jonathan said, that's our strategy. What do you think? And, and very tactfully, I sort of had to try and explain gently that it was a bit less of a strategy and more of a random wish list. Um, now, that's not uncommon in entrepreneurial small businesses, um, but that's where I was really able to start helping them to work out a more developed strategy. So again, using concepts from the MBA, and back in those days, it was Johnson and Scholes exploring corporate strategy. It's now exploring strategy, but that was the book back then. Um, but we began to adapt and apply tools that were really for bigger corporates, but with a very clear focus on not losing the great heart and flair of the culture of Jonathan Lee. We didn't want to become a heartless culture of corporate mentality. And throughout this process, we changed the legal status of the company from a partnership to a company limited by guarantee. We put in a new structure that would allow for growth. Um, we recruited a finance director and we changed Jonathan's role to chairman so that he was more strategic and client facing and a bit less involved in the day to day management. Together, the finance director and myself began to develop and implement performance tools, ones you'll be familiar with, such as Kaplan's balance scorecard and key performance indicators, all quite new stuff at the time, you know, great stuff. Uh, began upskilling staff with more modern consultancy approaches and training and developing things like account management processes. And all of this was done so that as we moved towards our growth, as we grew, we did that in a manner that was consistent with the values and the culture that we wanted to safeguard in the business. Now, a few years back in 2018, I was invited to celebrate 40 years of Jonathan Lee. Now, um, the two pictures on there of, of, of the groups of staff are from the earlier years of Jonathan Lee. And you can see the arrow pointing to me. I'm looking much younger than, than um, but, but we celebrated in 2018 uh, they'd grown to, four, to, to over 100 staff uh, that acquired and, and opened offices in various locations in the UK and overseas, and their turnover had grown to 84 million. And I'm convinced that if we hadn't have bought a strategic leadership approach with a real focus on culture, um, there would have been some growth, but it would have been quite limited. And, and this taught me that although many of the theories and concepts that I'd learned were gleaned from big business, and there are a few examples on the screen there, with just a little bit of creativity and adaption, they were equally valuable to smaller businesses, and as I found out later, to charities too. And certainly the principles of investing in strategic leadership and paying attention to culture were ones that prove themselves to be universally applicable. And it's also worth saying that as well as that sort of internal activity with Jonathan Lee, I was also consulting for some of the very big global brands, as well as some of the small local SME family businesses. And it was a really rich experience to be able to see close up and personal some of the best leadership and culture modelled and some of the not so good, but to help some of those organisations make an impact. 
And I think making an impact on real organisations, that's the thing that's inspired me and it stimulated my academic curiosity. So after nine years at Jonathan Lee, I took on a new challenge at a large secondary school and sixth form. Uh, to give you a feel for timing, this, this is now about 2003. And the head teacher had decided rather than simply replace the bursar who only looked after finance, he wanted to recruit a business director with a range of commercial experience, not from the education sector, someone who would restructure and run the school for him. Now that concept is, you know, quite well known now, but it was quite innovative at the time. Uh, back then the government had created a white paper which had the idea that teachers should be freed up to teach more what a great idea that is and so the head wanted me to restructure the school to achieve that goal but rather than put the focus on the physical restructure and just look at the changes to the systems that these are all very necessary rather we took a culture-led values approach See, one of the things that struck me, and you may have had experience yourself of this if you've dealt with schools in the past, uh, is the way that you're treated. When you report to reception in, in a school that's a bit more traditional, it's almost as though you're inconvenient and it's as though you're getting the way of other more important work that the receptionist or the administrator had. And this applied on artists, whether it was a whether it was a parent, whether it was a member of staff, whether it was a governor, uh, it didn't matter who it was um you know that that sort of approach was there there were other challenges like each member of staff was the only person who knew how to do their job nothing was written down no formal processes or procedures so if they left or if they were away on long-term sick it created big problems and it seemed as though knowledge was power and each role was very much guarded uh, and it left little room for things like teamwork so the approach I took was to say that we're going to create three distinct elements of our culture. We want excellent customer service, we want fantastic teamwork, and we want real flexibility. Um, supporting this, we did have to create all of the infrastructure that would embed the desired culture, so new job descriptions, competency-based appraisal systems, uh, those things just didn't exist at the time. We had to process map and document and improve all the processes and procedures and so on. But because we put those three values right at the heart of what we were doing, what I found was that the restructure process became very na natural and organic. We didn't have to make people redundant because most of those who didn't want to change or adapt or really didn't like this idea of a new approach self-selected and left the organization of their own accord and most of the ones that stayed saw it as a real major improvement on the quality of their working life and actually they would say it's something they'd been wanting for a really long time and then of course when we recruited new staff to backfill those who had left we selected the ones that had the sort of values that we were seeking to develop so for example they might have worked in sectors like banking and um sectors where there'd been real training and a real focus on things like customer service and a real professional element to that administration um, and i think i'd learned something at jonathan lee that i would always share with anyone uh, who's looking to recruit and that is you should always recruit for attitude and cultural fit even if it means that person might need some upskilling in certain elements of the job because you can train technical skills but it's much harder to train attitude. And particularly as you get to management and senior levels, one mistake in recruitment can cost you massively in terms of the impact that that has on you as the leader and on your organization. And I, I remember after just about four months of this, um, the chair of governors came into my office uh, and she said she was absolutely amazed at the transformation that she had experienced and the treatment that she'd had personally by the administrative staff in the school. Um, but it wasn't just that that sort of culture and staff motivation that had improved. The whole system and efficiency and capability was all transformed. Now, the head teacher at Cleve wanted me to take an MPQH head teacher qualification because he was adamant the, the strategic and commercial skills that were being brought into this context were needed for other schools and for the sector. But for me, I'd realized education was really important to me, but my sweet spot was more aligned to adult rather than child education. And so 
In 2005, I joined my first university, University of Wolverhampton, on a contract basis as a leadership and strategy consultant. Um, within a few months, I, I was recruited into a permanent associate dean role, as it happens, by your now vice chancellor, who was dean of the school at the time, Craig Mahoney. Um, but I've got to be honest, I wasn't quite prepared for the extent that this sector differed from all the other sectors that I'd worked in. I mean, I'd been taught all of the amazing leadership, culture and strategy concepts by a university. And so naturally, or rather naively, I expected universities to, the, to be the bastion of virtue, a shining light of best practice, thinking that HE would be an exemplar of organisational culture and be awash with brilliant leaders using and applying the latest leadership and strategy and culture techniques. Um, you know, when, when I'd worked at Jonathan Lee back in the 90s, I'd worked with people like Toyota Manufacturing, and I'd been massively impressed with their modern approach to people and process improvement and their contemporary leadership. So when I joined higher education, I anticipated something even better. Let's face it, this was a decade on. I thought it would be fantastic, but I had a rather rude awakening. <laughs> After just a very short time, I began to feel that the higher education sector, or at least my experience of it, was a bit more like British Leyland of the 70s than the Toyota of the 90s. And, and why do I say that? Well, um, it had a very hierarchical structure. It had quite a command and control top-down leadership. It was very heavily unionized. There were lots of committees and red tape that made everything 10 times slower than it needed to be. There was very much an us and them culture between the leadership management and the workers. Uh, quality seemed to be focused on gold plated paperwork, but had very little connection with the actual quality of what was going on at the coalface. Uh, and most critically, people who were really, really good academics were being promoted into administration or management or leadership roles um, because of their great academic achievements. But they had little to no management or leadership training. And also they did see the role as an administration role, not a leadership or management role. I remember talking to one head of department who came to me the once and said, I've got a real problem with morale in my department. What are you going to do about it? And I was like, hang on, I think we've got something slightly wrong here. So there was a real mixed bag of leadership capability. Um, and even as far back as 2005, I could see that the world of higher education needed to and was about to change. I was mindful of what had happened in the motor industry when the government made drastic changes to funding and inward investment and the UK motor manufacturing companies like British Leyland and others um, had to go through massive changes. You might remember uh, BL became Rover Group and joined forces with Honda and they tried to transform themselves but you know ended up being broken up and sold uh, to BMW and others. And I sense that the same sorts of changes, uh, the winds of changes were blowing across the higher education sector. Um, and, and, and as we look back, we can see all of those changes. And I, I, I did spend quite a long time at Wolverhampton, 13 years. Um, and, and it might sound a bit altruistic, but I wasn't really interested in or looking for vertical promotion. But I was genuinely wanting to bring a radical leadership and cultural change um, and to be honest, the, the school I was part of, we did make some fantastic steps forward. So at the time, the university had eight schools. Um, and as I said, there were some issues uh, for our school, the School of Sport, Performing Arts and Leisure, SPAL. We were on split campus locations. The facilities were really poor. I mean, the, the building you see there, we built a few years later. And that's brilliant, but we didn't have that at the time. Um, the university had quite a fragmented culture. Um, th there were many similarities to British Leyland. Um, before I joined, there'd been a staff stress survey and the results were really concerning. Um, but again, I took a culture and values led approach. So the first thing we did was set up one of the first ever university positive working environments group. Uh, we brought together staff from across every grade and every level uh, across academic support staff technicians uh, and we brought them together regularly in a very open and honest um, sort of forum where they could discuss how we would make significant improvements in culture. 
we started to bring in a more um, sort of transparent decision making approach. We uh, implemented middle management leadership training. We brought in a, a more modern appraisal system. Um, and I do remember at the end of a staff conference uh, in, in the early years, um, one of the drama lecturers stood up and said, this is the first time I've ever felt I could give my very honest opinion without being shot down or having my head bitten off. And, and everybody burst out in rapturous applause. And, and I mention this because I think the outcomes of that culture change were amazing. We were one of the fastest growing schools. We had a reputation for innovation, making things happen. We developed a raft of international and commercial partnerships that previously had been elusive. We were seen as the best led and the well, most well-run university in the school. Um, and I think it's because we really paid attention to creating a culture that empowered staff and gave them a staff voice and, and, and allowed them to have a really big stake in the way that the, uh, the, the, that part, that school, that part of the university was run. Um, and, and I was fortunate that I was also involved in quite a number of cross institutional strategic groups uh, in HR, in systems, in finance, all across the board, um, so that we could look at different areas where we could take the university forward. And it was really going all swimmingly, but, and you know there's always a but, after about five to six years, um, the university decided to restructure from eight schools to four faculties. I'm sure that's never happened to you. Um, and that really impacted us because our school was split between different faculties. And one of the biggest things I learned in this time was that that altruism that I'd had wasn't always the best strategy. Uh, and although I was able to influence my particular school and have some influence on the institution, when major changes occur from the top that are outside your control, it can unravel much of the good work that you've done. I mean, from a personal perspective, my work in the school was recognised. So during the restructure, I was given a senior faculty role. And shortly afterwards, I was asked to be strategic dean in the offices of the vice chancellor. And I spent four years working on regional strategies and cross institutional projects. So and I know that many of the staff from SPAL carried the principles into their new faculties. But it is still hard and it's sad to see all of that hard graft often you know, when it's about culture, it's behind the scenes, it's unseen. And when that comes to an end, it can be a bit difficult. Um, so what I need to mention now is my own research journey during this time at Wolverhampton. Back in 2008, I'd been charged by my dean to begin studying a PhD because he wanted every member of staff to have a doctoral level qualification. I didn't really want to do it. I had a young family, a senior academic role. I sat on the board of two charities and I was quite heavily involved in the leadership of a large local church that was also going through some challenging leadership transitions. And even to this day, my old boss says he dragged me kicking and streaming, screaming to the PhD journey. It took me nearly two years and several full starts to actually get to the registration phase. I initially um, started with my uh, alma mater BCU and I wanted to do a DBA, but just as I got my research proposal already, they pulled it before I could put in a registration because um, uh, they wanted to revalidate. I then found a place with Regents Theological College, uh, had to do some prep work with them. And just as I finished that, their validating university banger, you might remember this, lost all their powers of accreditation. Um, however, this led me to register with King's College London, where I was able to commence finally the PhD exploring the leadership and organizational culture of my denomination, the Assemblies of God. And the reason I did this was I'd observed lots of cultural and leadership challenges in Assemblies of God. And I wanted to understand how the historic leadership and organizational culture had shaped and was impacting the denomination today. So Ed China, who I mentioned earlier, um, in his book about leadership and organizational culture, had talked about three major influences on culture. He said the three influences of an organizational culture are the assumptions of the founding leaders, the learning of the organization over time, and new leader thinking. But of those three, the most critical was the founding assumptions. And given the fact that Assemblies of God was formed nearly a hundred years ago, I was keen to understand, well, to what degree 
can all that be true? And through that understanding, what I hoped to do was sow into how the denomination might move forward. And it's important to note that at the same time as starting the PhD, while I was working for Wolverhampton, I also began in, in, in my own time, my ministry status ordination training. So I was what they call, and what you'll know uh, if you're a researcher as an emic insider researcher. Um, and this meant that in addition to the historical desk research that I was looking at it, looking at critical incidences and clues about leadership and culture in assemblies of God's past, I was actively involved in field work as a participant observer. I was a trainee ordinand with Assemblies of God. And what that meant was I had free access to the national leadership team. So I was able to interview them. I was also a uh, part of the local church leadership team. So I was able to interview lots of other local church leaders too. Now, why there's a butterfly here is that having come from a hard scientific engineering background, the shift to ethnography was quite a difficult one. Even when I did my MBA dissertation, I'd used a very deductive scientific approach to the interview data. In fact, what I'd say on reflection is that the change of research perspective to truly embracing ethnography and not trying to squeeze it or make excuses for it and getting it into that more science based paradigm probably took two or three years. But once I'd made the switch, I found that I loved the inductive exploration, curiosity driven, clue searching and meaning making research even more than the hypothesis proving quantitative data approach that I'd been used to in the past. I have to say I am a true ethnographic convert. And the thing that really excited me about the PhD was the dawning realization that very little research existed that tried to bring the fields of ecclesiology, which is a branch of theology, practical theology, um, sociological and historical and organizational and business uh, studies into dialogue with each other. And it was brilliant as I was talking to some of the eminent leading theologian academics, they were saying that this was really important research. So that was great. And as a result, as you'd expect, my understanding of culture and leadership started to become more nuanced and sophisticated. It broadened and deepened. Um, and, and what I'd like to do is share a few of the ideas that came, you know, that, that, that came to be quite important to me and that I found useful. And the first of these is from Professor Joe Martin. Now, Joe Martin challenges the mainstream view that's often taken with popular organisational culture that sees culture as a homogenous, unified whole. And instead, Joe posits a three perspective lens of viewing culture. So you look at culture from these three elements of cultures that are integrated, um, parts and elements of the culture that are inconsistent, and those elements of the culture that are complex and paradoxical and confusing and conflicted. And this gives you a much richer picture of what's really going on under the surface. I also came across one of my favorite metaphors for organizational culture, which is terroir. Now, terroir is a term from France, and it doesn't really have an English equivalent word. It's from the French root terre, meaning earth, and terroir is a wine growing term that encompasses a rich depth of meaning. So terroir is the alchemy of the soil and its underlying geology. It's the altitude of the vineyard and the microclimate. It's the direction it faces. It's how well watered it is. It's whether it's on a hillside or in a valley. It's the history of the terrain and how well the soil has been worked down the centuries, even how near it is to a main road. All of this is needed. And to make good wine, it's not enough to be proficient in the mechanical crafts of winemaking or even just to understand the chemistry of fermentation. You have to know about the geology, the meteorology, the botany, the social geography and the cultural history. You need to know the terroir. Terroir carries with it not only the unchangeable long history facets of the land and the slow development of the geology over time, but it also has the capacity to include the unpredictable contemporary effect of weather changes and of course the way the vineyard is cultivated and as the wine society of, 90, of 1894 so insightfully posits gifted growers 
often make excellent wine in lesser vintages, just as in outstanding years, mediocrity can prove a stronger force even than mother nature. And whilst this is true of wine, I find it to be similarly resonant with organizations and their leaders. So I would say to you as a leader, you are the viticulturalist of your organization. Um, the other thing that really helped me was Gareth Morgan's work on the images of organizations. Um, it's based on the premise that almost all of our thinking about organizations is based on one or more of eight basic metaphors. And the main reason the book's usually valuable is that most of organizational conversations stay exclusively within one of those eight metaphors. And the worst thing is that most people are permanently stuck in their favorite metaphor and they can't simply understand the things that are said from another metaphor because this isn't about eight perspectives it's about eight languages and speaking eight languages is a lot harder than learning to appreciate eight perspectives the dominant metaphor that most of us have in the uk is organization as machine it's a very simplistic metaphor and it's embodied in the scientific approach to management which has its foundations in fail and taylorism any functionalist structuralist approach falls into this category and people might use words like top down bottom up centralized decentralized or you might have someone say i feel like a small cog in a big wheel um, without realizing it they're using this metaphor without realizing how narrow this view of organization is whenever the dominant focus is productivity or efficiency or uniformity this is organization as machine and you might have heard the phrase McDonaldization. I came across it when I was researching the church leadership, where, where the church really railed against bringing in concepts from the commercial sector, and they were said to be McDonaldizing the church. And if you've been in academia, you'll have heard it said the same thing about higher education. Because McDonald's is a very visible example of taking production, efficiency and uniformity to very high levels. But Morgan offers a total of eight popular metaphors, and, and obviously these are just the eight popular ones. There's machine, as we've mentioned, there's organism, brain, culture, political system, psychic prison, I like that one, change or flux, and an instrument of domination. And there's a lot that can be said for each metaphor, but I don't really have time, but by all means, do dip into Morgan's book. Now, when it comes to leadership and culture, we find that although leadership might try to change culture, leadership is itself shaped by the culture it exists in one of my biggest bugbears is the idea in corporate leaders that organizations need to have a strong culture and that's usually an excuse for a top-down strong leadership forcing a homogenous monoglot culture on the organization so one of my favorite discoveries was Dennis Turish's book which was the dark side of transformational leadership and I love this idea of a dark side, and it chimes with Hugh Wilmot, who I've put that quote at the bottom, who rails against the popularized, prescriptive, managerial perspective of corporate culturalism. He asserts that such approaches seek to manipulate culture in order to gain competitive advantage by establishing a, by establishing a strong normative corporate culture based on managerially defined core values for employees to devote themselves to and assess themselves by, thus creating compliant patterns of behavior and therefore a media of domination, a form of nascent totalitarianism that he likens to George Orwell's 1984. That's quite a strong way of saying it. Um, so in the light of that, what I suggest as leaders, we need to see ourselves not as the leaders who believe we can forcefully change the form of an organization from the outside as an act of our will and grim determination, something that Parker Palmer sees as an act of violence in the name of a vision, but rather as co-laborers and co-curators of culture, rather like the viticulturalist of the vineyard who seeks to understand and cultivate the culture. And I believe when we do that, we create far more opportunities for us for sustainable health and growth in our organizations. The other element I found from my research is that leadership is a contested, conflicted academic field. It's complex. It's confusing. It can be paradoxical. It has no single agreed definition. 
Uh, in fact, leadership thinking emanates from many different fields who see leadership from different ways, or as we say it in academia, it has different ontologies and epistemologies, and it's often bound to predominant social views of the world. Lots of what is considered popular leadership wisdom is actually outdated or misguided, or it isn't really based on rigorous evidence. And that's why I love studying it. I um, told you I was an orthodox. For me, this brought to the forefront the importance of understanding the history of leadership thinking, um, as well as being obviously familiar with lots of modern concepts and views. And this is something I impress on my MBA senior leader students, that too many of our views of leadership were constructed in sociological paradigms that are now outdated, but they're still in the popular consciousness particularly in the portrayal of leadership in the media. Just think about charismatic leadership, great man theory. Um, and, and often the media portray our big leaders in that way as the hero. Uh, and that's in part why I feel we still have issues with equality, inclusion, diversity, with the gender pay gap uh, because of this rooting of, uh, of theory. And I always say that leadership thinking might have developed in a chronology that's on the screen now but it isn't a linear process. It's not as though one theory replaces the last one. So what you have is a melting pot of ideas. And many of the senior leaders that I work with now, and many that I worked with as a consultant, actually are very limited in their understanding of leadership theory. So I've already mentioned Simon Weston's book on, on leadership. Um, I'd also point to academics like Peter Northhouse and his book on leadership theory. I think that one is brilliant if you're a practitioner. Um, and then Duggan is a great one if you're into more of the critical management approach to leadership theory. Uh, and just as an example, many of my senior leaders haven't even heard of Hershey and Blanchard's situational leadership, even though it's decades old. And, and when they are introduced to this and begin experimenting with it, they have reported transformational effect on their teams. Um, and it, particularly when they couple it with concepts like authentic leadership or servant leadership. And I regularly meet with employers of our senior leaders. So chief execs and senior directors of organizations are consistently telling me that this process of deepening and broadening senior leaders understanding of leadership and culture is making a real tangible positive impact on the health of their organizations. Nearly done. Just before I finish my last few slides, I wanted to double back in time because it's worth saying that as well as my paid employment and my research, the application of leadership and culture theory in organizations has also come from the voluntary work as a church leader and as a board of, uh, uh, as a director on a board of directors of charities. And here's just two examples where we had to navigate difficult leadership transitions. One was from the founding pastor of a very large church that I belong to, to their associate minister. Um, and the other one was the replacement of the chief exec at a performing arts charity. And I have to say, um, the one at Salt Mine went quite well, um, and we had some good outcomes from that. The one at the church around 2007, 2008, despite our best efforts and bringing all of this theory in, didn't go as well. Um, but it was a really valuable learning experience. And all of this relates back to the Kolb cycle of concrete action, which allows reflection, conceptualization, and experimentation through our experiences from one cultural context, bleeding into and informing the others. More recently, over the past few years, I've been approached by several private HEIs, uh, Bible colleges, um, to act as a senior advisor and strategic leadership consultant. And whenever I've done this and take them through the, the analysis process, um, we always find that the main area that needs the most work is their leadership and culture. And absolutely, finally, one of the most recent explorations of leadership and culture has been in the NHS. So on the screen, you see one of my part time PhD students, Janet Mortimer. Now, Janet had a mock fiver this morning and did really well. And she said she was going to join us today, so she might be on the chat. And for the past four years or so, Janet has been doing extensive research on the NHS trust that she works for. And one of the key things um, that transpired as we journeyed together through the PhD process was that while there's been a lot of focus on culture in the NHS and many academic studies have tended towards interviews and data gathering from more senior and clinical level leaders in the trusts, um, 
there are lots of hidden voices that haven't been uh, talked to. Those who work in nursing or lower paid uh, admin roles or, or what you would call manual roles, whose insights have been overlooked by the research. And Janet's been exploring the relationship between culture, leadership and special measured measures. And while she hasn't ignored the input from CEOs and senior leaders, her research has specifically ensured that all the voices are considered. And this has led to a really rich understanding of what's really going on. And of course, if culture is the water that we swim in, then I guess one of the most important questions we can ask and that I want to leave you with is what's really going on? It's why I love leadership and culture so much, because getting a deep understanding of your leadership and culture can take you out of the immediate environment, lift you above the surface patterns and allow you to then dive beneath the surface and understand what's really going on. So that's my winding road of research, which has often been applied leadership in practice in action. One of the dangers of becoming an ethnographer, I recognise, is that things become about the narrative and the story. Uh, I know that might have been hard for you, but we're more on just the uh, give us just the facts basis. But I hope within some of the things I've said, there's been some stimulus for a wider discussion in this last half an hour. So thanks for your, for your kind attention. And Christian, I will finally hand you back to you. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Will, for that. I think it was so elaborate, it was so engaging, so insightful, and I really, really learned a lot as well. So it's now time for the discussion. So any questions for Will? I, I, it was quite engaging, so I would like, uh, I can't see questions on the chat, so please feel free to, either you can uh, show your hands or anything, or you can unmute yourself either way. So any questions or anything you want to ask, or any comments at all from what's uh, Will said. I think Dominic wants to say something. Well, first of all, I could say, well, really enjoyed that. <clears throat> I mean, you probably won me over anyway. I'm very familiar with the work of Shine, used that in my PhD. I agree, very powerful. What really struck me as well was Gareth Morgan's book and your reference to that. Sometimes I think it's overlooked uh, in these days. I mean, it must be probably 30 years old plus. Yeah. And still as relevant as it was 30 years ago. And I just wonder, I mean, you, you've talked a little bit about the machine, uh, the metaphor. Oh, you, you made a quick reference to psychic prisons. And I just wonder whether you could say a little bit about maybe where you've seen that in organisations. Definitely. I mean, um, I, I've got to be careful how I say this. Um, with some of my work with some of the larger corporates, um, what, what I sense, we know that in the NHS, if you look at the King's, um, the King's Foundation uh, research, uh, there's a massive issue with harassment and bullying in the NHS. Um, and, and working closely with senior leaders and getting up close and personal with some of their issues, um, I would even go as far as to say that I have observed what could even be called gaslighting in, in these environments. So. Um, for me, the psychic prison is where, uh, you know, you, you are in this um, context where uh, you are bound to either that leader or that manager or that organisation um, and you don't have many recourses uh, to, to change that within the organisation, but there are oppressive things happening within that. Um, and I, I, I think you're right. I, I, did, I did wonder about including Morgan because sometimes on a talk like this, you want to just put the more, more recent research, but some, some of the stuff, even the some of the stuff by Max Weber is still very, very relevant to how organizations are being led and managed today. And this is, this is why I do that timeline of organizations, because I think, although you could say, well, some of these theories are quite old, um, they, they are still some of the dominant theories that people go to either, either when they're leading or they're being trained or it's some of the intuitive stuff that happens. So yeah, I agree with you about Morgan. And I, I do think, I mean, in universities as well, I think in any large corporate organization, um, you will either find it as the main culture, or you might find it in the subcultures as well. But I've, I've seen it going on in, in a number of the larger organizations I work for, certainly. I think you make a really interesting point about some of the older theory, which is often good theory stands the test of time. But I know clearly when all of us are publishing 
making sure you're up to date as well. I mean, I, I don't envy uh, sort of newer colleagues. <laughs> when I was doing my PhD, there wasn't quite as much literature to review as there is now. And I think that I've, I've been around long enough to just see an exponential growth in the number of management publications. So I really feel for early career researchers who have a much more difficult challenge, I think, certainly than I did. Yeah, and I think I think some of the um, uh, I mentioned Janet. I'm not sure she's on the line actually, but um, you know we looked at what sort of approach she was going to take for a literature review. For exactly that reason, you have to be um, quite targeted. Oh, Janet is here. I mean, Janet, you might want to talk about what the the scalping review that you did and 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 that and that challenge of finding the right literature. Yeah. Hi, Will. Hi, everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I mean, before I go on to that, I was just thinking about the psychic prisons comment and in the context of my research. Um, and I was thinking about the fact that um, some of my participants were saying that um, even being able to take up, you know, less than an hour out of their schedule of sort of being on that machine and just carrying on within the prison of this is what I must do every day, this is my life was emancipating for them so in that way that's how I sort of thought about I uh, you know took the psychic prisons image in 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 that sort of you know situation <laughs> but yeah I did do a, a scoping literature review which I mean I find that to be really really fantastic because when I started out on my research I couldn't find any literature you know that was strictly about special measures and the impact that that has um on organizational culture within the nhs so a scoping literature review allows you to sort of well it's the clues in the name isn't it you can have a much broader look at things around the subject and get a general idea of right where who's been researching this you know what what methodologies have been used um what are their findings you know really high level just to get an idea and then when you've got an, an overall view of the subject you can then drill down into areas of that you're really interested in and do a bit more of a critical analysis of those papers yeah hey, thanks thanks very much janet for that i, I think uh the, the whole idea was to talk more i think that book as well i've, I've read it and when i read it then it was a very very enlightening book I'm glad that Dominic was able to even elaborate more and will have said, said ab about as well, especially with the, the eight metaphors that uh, Leo was trying to elaborate on. I think we still have more people. I think we have Alexandra. Alexandra wants to say something. So Alexandra, you can unmute yourself and... Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Will, for sharing such a rich experience, both um, of your industry and academic um, um, career it's been such a really interesting story um, and you presented a very lovely rich view of leadership as a almost like a quality cultured and value process that sort of sits at the root or rather at the heart of effective organizing and managing and change leading so that's really refreshing and I guess that's that's important when we actually often see that process being portrayed more as a sort of sitting somewhere in a corner as a process that is being you know dipped um, or 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 tag in a particular stage of development rather than an underpinning idea and i think that is really really very very coming clearly from from your experience um and i guess um what i what I appreciate that that very discontinuous nature of of leadership as a, as a culture driven, but you promote very authentically that idea, um, and you actually live by the idea of culture and values based leadership approach. And how do you achieve that? I mean, you postulated, you know, how do you achieve that in, for example, in your MBA program? But maybe rather how you preserve that quality in education when the trend now is for actually eradicating critical and ethical content, you know, that very often without actually, you know, making accusations, but more kind of a, a concern for disappearance of, of that very sort of rich critical content that is very important for untangling and inviting that messiness. Um, and I guess, you know, could appear as a um, superficial when we present stuff only in a and the metrics and the processes and mechanics. Um, 
funnily enough, um, I was actually just a couple of weeks ago looking for ideas of this sort, and I actually reached to Gareth Morgan book as well, because that idea of thinking time, reflection, or imaginization, that's the language he's using, imaginization, so moral imagination goes hand in hand with leadership of that quality. So the question comment is, yes, how do you actually preserve it and nurture it? You know, digesting books like that needs time. You can't very quickly fit it, you know, in five minutes video. Um, what is your advice for actually preserving that kind of a culture of inquisitiveness and richness? Okay. Apologies, it was very much um, yeah. uh, over long, but it, it you really sparked my imagination. And, and thank you very much again for very engaging and uh, um, insightful presentation. Thank you. That's that's really kind. I think I think responding to you know, there's a number of things you raised there. I think one of the challenges with trying to be an authentic values led leader that that is interested in the culture is when you're working with others who don't have that same value um particularly when they're more senior than you in the organization uh so you end up almost creating a little protective bubble of the bits that you can influence um but it creates some cognitive dissonance so so um there have been times in my career where that's had a, an effect on my mental well-being um, because it puts you in a difficult situation. So that's that's one of the challenges. Um, I do feel though that in, in the practical context where I've developed leaders who work with me and in the academic context where I'm developing uh, MBA students through delivering leadership and sort of material like, you know, the, like, like you do on the MBA. Um, when I was putting my case together for chair, what I realized was that I want to become someone who changes leaders who change the world. You know, I can't change the world, but what I can do is I can sort of give these ideas to other leaders because I know these ideas, I've seen them in lots of different contexts make change for the good, whether that's the health of the organization or the growth of the organization. So there's, there's something about that. And I tend to bring in the critical and the ethical elements by relating them to issues that are at the forefront of leadership discourse at the moment. So, you know, if, if I want to talk about diversity and gender and inclusion and race, then I have to bring in the ethical, moral dimensions of that as a foundation in order for people to be able to explore those properly. Um, so I, I haven't personally, I, I mean, we have changed at Keele. We did change from a critical management school to a business school. So it has been, you know, I joined it when it was a business school, but the, there are still some people going through that, that, that change. And I know it's quite difficult, but for me, it's not an either or, um, you know, we don't, we don't, we, you know, I, I am a firm believer in experiential learning and learning from doing and ref, learning from reflection. But I believe you can't get the depth of learning that you need unless you've got that critical reflection and that deep academic theoretical underpinning. So, um, it, you know, what I try and do is create that balance. And because people see that it's actually having an impact in their organisations on their, you know, the, the number of senior leaders who come back to me and, and talk about the fact that their relationships with their teams, the way their teams are approaching work has been transformed purely from one little part of a module that we've done you know it's it's it, it that that's what that's what really gets me out of bed in the morning really that's lovely thank you uh, thanks very much uh will and Ale alexandra for the engaging discussion any more questions uh, for will we, we still have some minutes so questions 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 is it time to ask questions or any comments really while people if, if people just put their hand up or drop something in the chat rather than having empty space um one of the brilliant things i found about the assemblies of god uh which i didn't really talk about in the presentation was that the decisions made a hundred years ago when that denomination was being formed are still massively impacting the way that the organization is led and run today even to the extent that they've had to go on a massive journey of even having leaders that lead the central denomination because when it was set up each church had its own local autonomy and it was all administered administered 
But the problem with administration is that when you grow, which it really did grow, it grew up to 200, 400 churches, that administration no longer provides what's needed for that denomination to be healthy. So I didn't mention much about the actual PhD I've done, but that was one of the one of the big findings was that actually the, in this particular instance, what Shine said is absolutely right. The founding assumptions of the original leaders were still having the biggest impact on the on the organization today. Thank you very much, Will. I think Wojciech wants to ask a question. Wojciech? Yeah, Just give me a second to switch my camera back on. Uh, thank you for the insightful presentation. Um, I kind of noticed that we, when you were talking about culture and the different ways um, how, how culture factored into leadership and organizational control, really, we kind of stopped at normative control. That's where the that was the cutoff point. But in recent years, we've had something which makes the dark side look not so dark, which is the neo-normative forms of control. The idea that people can well tell them that their job is about authenticity and self-actualization and realization, and you can you don't even need to have cultural values anymore. All you can people will push themselves in a very sort of uh, neoliberalist capitalist. Um, way because they will start identifying underperformance as a personal failure. Yeah, they have essentially um, become self-controlling. It's not even controlled by values anymore. It's 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 self-control. And if you read some of the CMS side of things, yeah, um, people have research that there's research on how this um, prime example, which kind of hits the media these days computer games industry, crunch time, exploitation, and how people eventually just do nothing but simply crash out from the profession because their enthusiasm for the industry has been simply exploited and decimated. So I was wondering, um, given the negative press, yeah, and what organizations and people who have implemented the anomaly control, have, how they've been portrayed, do you think there's a, there's a way to put a positive spin on it? How, how to how how to become a positive lead, sort of like a more positive perceived leader, <clears throat> which actually allows people to self-actualize without using them for the advantage of the organization at their own disadvantage, well, to their destruction in some cases. I, I, I think that's a great question, and I, I think this might spurn some discussion, so I'll let other people jump in. But um, I, I think if we take what happened in COVID, uh, there's a really good example here of uh, a historical view of leadership or management um, being based on the uh, transactional analysis of parent adult child. So, you, you know, the Eric Byrne um, parent adult child transactional analysis. I think what happened in COVID is organizations and leaders who uh, historically that managerialism has been about the parent child relationship. I think as, as things fundamentally changed in COVID, uh, it had to bring a more adult adult relationship into that context uh, because people were working from home. They, they were working in different different um, sort of spaces. They were they were having to deal with different challenges. And certainly, certainly from both my senior leaders and the organisation I work for, I, I noticed that that had started to change. And I think as as workplaces become more agile, as organisations become less rigid and more flexible then that moved to to more adult rather than parent child uh, understanding of what it, what it means to be an employee what it means to be managed what it means to be led um comes to the forefront but i mean what what have other people got to say okay uh, uh thanks uh, will for that and thanks Wojciech for that question i think we just have uh, just eight minutes left for me it's just we know that culture is the hardest thing to change uh, based on experience and based on theory. One of the things I would uh, just uh, ask you, uh, Will, is more like you've tried, you've been a consultant, you've been in academia, and you've tried to change organizations and of course, higher education. Where do you think, which one was, do you think was the, the toughest? Was it higher education? Because you were almost trying to say higher education was the toughest act for you, or was it uh, the real, was it uh, the real organizations or the practical organizations that we tend to work with? What about the, what, which one was really the hardest one for you in terms of cultural change? 
Well, what a great question. I wouldn't want to generalize from this because I think the extent of cultural change has got many different uh, sort of facets associated with it. And, and, and what I try, when, I, when I talk to my students, I try to get them out of thinking of changing the organizational culture in a, in, in a sort of top down way and more a case of understanding the organizational culture and trying to shape it. And that shaping for me is always around creating more health than it is around creating efficiency or productivity or wherever else. Although those other things do do tend to happen. I think higher education, um, when when I joined in 2005, um, was was quite a rigid culture. Certain, certainly, you know, the university I worked in and the other ones around, it felt, you know, the processes, the systems, the the hierarchies. And as I say, I think I think it was it didn't seem to have adopted many of the more sort of contemporary enlightened empowerment type things that I'd seen at, 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 at more sort of forward thinking organizations. Um, saying that the culture within the school I worked for changed quite rapidly. Um, and I think it changed quite rapidly because people felt that they had a, a, a stake in the change they actually wanted it to, you know, what we were saying to people is, look, we want this to be a place where you love to come to work. We want this to be a place where you really enjoy what you're doing. And we want to address some of the things that have stopped there in the past. Um, so I think higher education as, as a university, it, it still hasn't changed the way I would have liked it to do. Um, but that, that overall institutional change takes a lot longer because it's more complex, it's bigger. And because sometimes the people at the top are not, actually doing things for cultural change that's not their priority um so i think i think if you've got if you've got people in the organization in senior leadership roles who understand the importance of culture who have got the skills to be able to manage um that shaping of culture in a positive way then that will have a a quicker turnaround than if you've got people who don't really understand culture or are not interested in it and are just trying to change the organisation. Um, so I think I think it does depend. But yeah, I would say higher education has been has, has been a particular a particularly tough one. Okay, I think just we just have four five minutes. I think I your daily that's the last question before we go. Okay, uh, thanks, Will, for the insightful presentation. I just want to ask a question. And the question is that uh, uh, comparing the leadership of higher education and the industry, do you think there is any area of overlap or are they entirely different? Because for example, I am moving from the industry to the academic and I'm I'm a bit of, am I really making the right decision? Am I really going to enjoy it? Is there any area of overlap or is there anyone that seems to be better than the other? Mm. Um, that's a really, a really, really insight, a really useful question. When I, when I was joining academia, um, the professor who'd supervised me during my MBA said, think long and hard about it, Will, because things just take so long and they're very frustrating in higher education. Um, and having moved from quite a high moving consultancy role, um, you can get very, very frustrated with uh, some of the uh, long ranging processes and procedures. Uh, so that's one difference. I think it's changing, but I think in when, when, certainly when I came into higher education um, and, and I actually saying that I, I was just at, at so when I was preparing for my uh, professorial role, I went to a um, to a BAM event that was around preparing for to be an education professor, and and it was interesting to hear the senior people in the room who'd achieved these high levels all saying that they hadn't had any training, they hadn't had any development in leadership, and they'd had to work it all out for themselves. I think in in industry. Um, it was a bit like that in the 70s you know if you were a good if you were good on the shop floor you became the foreman or you became the shop steward um whereas it changed a lot and it's much more competency based 
I think in higher education, there's still a value um, assigned to things like research and publication and grants and output. Yet often, I'm not saying all the time, but often to get those things, you have to be quite a selfish person. Uh, you don't always have the range of emotional intelligence. I'm sure everyone in the room here does. Um, and, and so people do get promoted based on those criteria without necessarily having the emotional intelligence, the, you know, the social intelligence, the interpersonal skills that you would find in industry. So that, that can sometimes be challenging. I don't think there's, I don't think there's a consensus on what good leadership in higher education looks like. Whereas I think in industry, there is in, in particular sectors, it's different across sectors, but I think there is more of a recognition of this is good leadership and this is what we need to do to get it. Um, in higher education, I think because it's, you know, you, you're trying to meld two worlds, you're trying to meld the world of the academic, uh, the world of the academic researcher, which is a different thing again, with the administration and with the leadership, it's a much more difficult, a much more difficult place. Um, but but it is changing. Hey, thanks very much, Will, for that. And thanks, Aya, for the question. Uh, we just have two minutes, or we just have a minute. So I would like to thank uh, Professor Will Foster for this is insightful presentation. I, we, I think we found uh, it very informative, even from the feedback on the chat. I also want to thank everyone for attending. I know it's quite a lot of people. It's a, it's a summer, so a lot of people could have been out, but it was great having this. And it's, a, it's an inaugural one, so it's great to have uh, us started. And there was going to be another one is bi-monthly. So in the next two weeks, we're going to have another one on the 8th of September. So please, I have put the, the link on the chat. So please try to register. This has come to stay. But I would like to thank everyone for attending. And of course, I want to thank Will for this informative presentation as well. These recordings will be available on the, the UWS YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch and get much more. Of course, even the, the information, the slides and everything will be also be available on the, the channel as well. So I think we were able to get the time. So it's 1430. I'm never so I'm not I'm not so good at timekeeping, unfortunately. That's one of my <laughs> weaknesses. But I think today I, I tried. So that's half two and that's the end. Then the one in the next two weeks is just one hour. So it's just uh, because this is the external one and it was meant to be one hour 30 minutes. So subsequent ones, the internal one will be just one hour. So thank you very much and have a great day and we will see in the next two weeks. Thank you. Bye.